uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not going to introduce my friends and panelists um, yeah, because I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm going to start with furthest away. I want to know in two minutes or less how you got to the Court of Appeals from Chandigarh, India. Oh. Guess who started? Yeah, yeah, take a guess. I guess that would be me. I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming I'm the one from Chandigarh, India, unless you two <laughs> happen to be from Chandigarh, India. Okay, assumption, safe assumption. So first of all, what a great pleasure to be here um, in front of a small, intimate gathering. And especially with Walter, I think all of us share in our devotion to Walter as his protégés over the years. And it's, I think one way to frame your question is, what is the serendipitous sequence of events that would have had to have come together to take someone like me from Chandigarh, India, to appearing before the American Constitutional Society as a judge? And I'm tempted to say the surprising sequence of events that would have to occur is for someone to come before this body as a judge. But for me, in some ways, the most surprising thing is to come within the ambit of the American Constitution to begin at all. Because I was born halfway around the world. I was born at that time. I was zero years old, which I think is true of most people. Um, <laughs> we, we moved to the United States, and my mom and dad had the classic immigrant vision for me and my sisters. Uh, we came here and settled down in Kansas and came of, way, of age in a land that we didn't know we were going to stay in. But as things moved on, we became increasingly, uh, I think, enthusiastic about the fact that this was the land in which we were going to spend the rest of our days and the rest of my parents' days, for sure. And it wasn't until age 23 that I became a United States citizen. And if you think about the chronology, 15 years before I was born, under the letter of the law, I couldn't have become a United States citizen because by, by dint of congressional statute from the late 1700s, naturalized citizenship was limited to white persons in the letter of the law. And so it was only in, it was only in 1952 that that changed. In 1967, I was born and we came here. 23 years later, I became a United States citizen, had to take the citizenship test, which is a civics exam. If we can just keep a small secret between us, I didn't get all the questions right. I missed one on the Constitution. It should <laughs> give people a great deal of confidence who appear before me as a judge. I think I've rectified that. But uh, 23 years old, I became a naturalized US citizen. 23 years later, I became a federal judge, exactly 23 years later. So if you think about it, at 23, I took the oath of citizenship from a federal judge. At 46, I could give the oath of citizenship as a federal judge. That is an almost inconceivable trajectory. It's inconceivable to me, and I think it would have been inconceivable to my parents, but because of their vision, their ingenuity, their audacity, they decide, decided to give it a go here for us, for me and my sisters, and we've been the beneficiaries of it ever since. And in sort of a remarkable, feet of chronological dexterity. I came on the bench at 46 as a federal judge. I've been on for a little over five years. I'm still 46. So <laughs> it's remarkable. So that's... Pam? Um, well, I, I'm actually very happy to be here today. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here. I'm particularly excited that I can talk about my path to the bench when part of my origin story is actually sitting in the audience, and that is my two siblings, um, Liz Harris, who is a judge on the Court of Appeals in Colorado, and my sister, Tiffany Harris, who's a criminal defense lawyer in Portland, Oregon, and pretty much the best criminal defense lawyer there. And so they were there for, my, for the beginning of my path to the bench, which was when I was in middle school, my mother, who was a single mom of four kids, decided to go to law school, to put herself through law school. And she did it not for some kind of academic appreciation of the law, but because she really believed that the law affected people's everyday lives. And in particular, she saw the law as a way of equalizing the playing field for people with less power. And so when I graduated from high school, she graduated from law school, same week, um, and she went to work. She practiced for only a short time because she died way too young. But she practiced working with women who were in distress in a family law practice, and she represented children in criminal proceedings. And so the four of us grew up watching this amazing example of what the law could mean to people and how important the intervention of the law could be in people's lives. And all four of us became lawyers. We're like a walking joke. Um, uh, 
I'm so proud of my siblings and the work they do. And there's a sense, I think, in which the die was kind of cast. When my mom went to law school, like that, that was the beginning of my path to the bench. And then the rest of it, when I think about it, is really a series of investments that people made in me. And some of them didn't even know me. I went to college on a Pell Grant. Um, I'm a financial aid kid, college and law school. People who didn't even know me invested in my future. I'm enormously grateful for that. It changes the way I think about um, what we owe each other in this country. Uh, people who knew me saw potential in me that I did not see in myself. Um, one of those people is Walter Dellinger, probably the best mentor I ever had. Another is Don Johnson, who you just heard from, who was my first direct boss when I was at Office of Legal Counsel. Um, I had professors who saw things in me. I worked for two magnificent judges for Harry Edwards in DC and uh, John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. Um, and I just feel that at every step of my career, people helped me along with so much generosity and so much confidence in what I could do um, that to this day, I am just enormously grateful. The rest of my story is in the program, along with a picture that was apparently taken of me 40 years ago. <laughs> That's definitely what I still look like. Um, and the, the last thing I will say about kind of the path to the bench, I had the amazing good fortune to have so many great jobs before I became a judge. I love my job as a judge, it is a great job. But I don't think of my career as sort of like an ascension to this pinnacle spot where I'm a judge. I have loved every single one of my jobs. They have all let me feel like I'm contributing, like I'm helping people, like I'm making a difference in the world. And so this job is great, but so are the rest of them. And I'm just, I look out on this room and I'm so excited for the work I know you're all gonna do and how rewarding I think you will find it. I should say, in case the program is not completely available, that Pam Harris is a judge of the D.C. Circuit. I'm sorry, of the Fourth Circuit. <laughs> Shri Srinivasan is a judge of the D.C. Circuit and David Barrett is a judge of the First Circuit. And David, I yelled at on his very first day on the job in the <laughs> Office of Legal Counsel, <laughs> David Barron. Don't yell at me today. <laughs> um, well, as Sri and uh, Pam said, it, it's really just an amazing uh, occasion to be here looking out. There's uh, so many people who are here who actually played a direct role in a very tangible way, Ricky among them, uh, in helping me become a judge uh, during the confirmation process. But also, I was a uh, young professor when ACS uh, was started by Peter uh, Rubin and remember mentoring students and uh, being at occasions like this. So to see all the young people here invest in it, trying to figure out what you think about our Constitution and what you can do to make it uh, a document that we're proud of is uh, inspiring, just as it was when I was a, a young professor doing this type of thing. How it came to be, I mean, I have, a, a, in a way, a uh, story that starts with a lot of advantages, to be honest. My father was a law professor and taught constitutional law for uh, half a century here at George Washington. He was the dean of GW Law School, so uh, I came to law school pretty teched up uh, <laughs> about how to do it, having talked to him my whole life uh, about constitutional law. I still can see him uh, lying on the couch reading Marbury versus Madison, which he did at the beginning of every year. In fact, he retired at the age of 80, and he said to me, I just can't read this case one more time. <laughs> and what I thought, having taught myself for 15 years, is, you know, I know professors who don't read it each time. So uh, I was impressed that he still uh, did. But I think law was always uh, present to me. My mother uh, was a county attorney and then was the general counsel for the Housing Authority in Fairfax County. And so I always had an idea of law as something that was a public-minded enterprise, and I'm sure that stuck with me, but maybe precisely because there was so much law around me, my first thought was not to do law, and when I graduated college, I went to North Carolina to be a newspaper reporter uh, at the Raleigh News and Observer. And for young people here, just the way your career goes, that was probably the single most important decision I made to becoming a judge, uh, not knowing it then, and the reason is it made me tied to North Carolina. And as a result, when I went to law school, my first summer I went to a firm in North Carolina, a civil rights firm that Julius Chambers had helped found, called Ferguson, Stein, and Watt. And one of the summer interns there happened to have been a student of Walter Dellinger. 
we stayed friends, and many years later, after I clerked for a judge I greatly admired, who sadly passed away uh, recently, Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit. And Justice Stevens, uh, this student, Ann Hubbard, uh, set me up for a lunch with Walter Dellinger. Uh, and through that lunch, I got hired at the Office of Legal Counsel. That really changed, I think, the trajectory of my professional life, uh, because I worked there as a Junior lawyer, I replaced uh, Pam. If you, if you can't tell, to get on this panel, you have to be friends with Walter. Um, and uh, I replaced Pam. And then after I taught for a number of years, I came back as the uh, acting assistant attorney general for the Office of Legal Counsel uh, when Don uh, Johnson asked me to be a deputy uh, in the office. So I think without that, I, I think I wouldn't have become a judge. But it's just a way in which choices that you make, uh, the twists and turns of who you end up connecting with, you can't predict them. Um, and you really shouldn't try, I think. You, you have to do what you feel is a meaningful thing to do at the moment and have some faith that it'll lead to something where you can make a positive difference going forward. You know, Pam's uh, statement about the people that make investments in you, you know, for me, I realized in retrospect, it was a 10th grade teacher named Oma Lafferty who had gotten a master's degree at the University of Chicago at the turn of the century, and had no positions open to a woman except to teach in a provincial public school in the South. Uh, but I think she was brilliant, and nobody, she was disheveled and older, and, uh, but I, I thought she was amazing. And at the end of the 10th grade, she knew that my family had no books or magazines or anything like that in the house. We, we, my mother was a, 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 a clothing, furnishing sales clerk. And so she called me up and said she hoped in a couple of years I'd find a way to go to college, but she wanted to make sure I had something to read for the entering two years. And she bought me a two-year, I never had even Newsweek. Right? She bought me a two-year subscription to the London Economist, <laughs> which arrived fortnightly on that thin uh, airmail that the older people will remember. And it was bracingly sort of free market economics and strange spellings, <laughs> labor and all the L-A-B-O-U-R. And I read every issue and, for, and I was nearly 40 before it occurred to me when I was going through some difficult period how extraordinary it was for a public school teacher out of her own salary to buy some kid a two-year subscription to the London Economist. It was just amazing. So, so our topic today, doing theory slash doing law, how law looks from different perspectives, uh, sort of originated in a talk under that title that I gave to the Yale Legal Theory Workshop the year I left government, to think about having actually been in a real law position, how theory differed. And then Pam and I did that together as a talk to the entering class at Yale Law School, uh, where I did doing theory, doing law, and she did doing law, doing theory. Um, so that's how we got started in this. I wanted to ask about, about examples any of, you, any of you all feel for how law looked differently to you when you were in different roles. Who wants to start? David, do you have? Sure. Well, um, when Walter called me out the panel, I, I was talking to him just the difference between teaching and, and judging. So I had not had a conventional practice experience uh, before I had been at the Office of Legal Counsel, but let's be honest, that's not really practicing in the, in the traditional way. It's not litigating. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was uh, in the process of being nominated, I was at some uh, event, and it was various people who were prominent in the bar in Boston, and they were going around the room telling your favorite courtroom story that you were involved in. And I was getting quite alarmed because there was no such story for me to tell. But fortunately, the doorbell <laughs> rang at that moment. I was never asked the question. Um, but teaching was really my background. And, and the difference between teaching and judging is just vast, uh, I think. It, the way I was explaining it to Walter is, in class, if somebody raises a point that's not in the readings, no one seems to have thought about, just appears on the fly, that's a wonderful moment in teaching. And I want to grab hold of that moment and let's all talk about that. If that happens when I'm judging, <laughs> my instinct is I don't want anything to do with that. 
And so that's just, the, it, it's the particularity of the actual problem and dispute that you're facing that you're so focused on as opposed to the general issue. And you're so focused, I think, on being part of a system. You know, one, one way to think about it is, um, why did they invent the job that you have? I think is a good question to ask. Because it helps you give some grounding of why it might be that you're doing this job. And it's definitely invented judging to deal with competing advocates fussing out an issue and presenting it to you. And so when an issue comes up outside that context where it hasn't been vetted, you know, given the authority you have, there's a real risk of doing something very problematic on a whim. Uh, and that whole feeling about the importance of deciding a particular dispute, I just think is quite different than what you have to do when you're uh, in a classroom. Uh, Pam and Shree have both been in private practice, happily with me. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, you've taught, as David has, uh, uh, and you've been in government um, uh, at OLC and in the Solicitor General's office. Uh, Comments on how legal issues look differently, depending on your role? I, I will say one quick, just quick thing. Um, I agree with everything David said about teaching versus judging. One thing that struck me about the difference between practice, litigating, and judging, and there's a million differences, obviously, but one that um, preoccupies me, is fair to say, you know, as an advocate, you're working within precedent, right? Um, you, you take the precedent you have, it, and you're, there's still room for a lot of creative argument. You know, you're arguing for development of precedent in specific ways or kind of navigating precedent to get to where you want to go. Um, but you're not responsible for the precedent. It's not, they're not your decisions. Your responsibility is your client. You make the best argument you can. The court gets it wrong, the court gets it right, but then you walk away and it's not on you. But when you're a judge, you're, even more constrained by precedent, but this time it's on you. Like those decisions are your decisions. And there is a, um, there's a freedom to advocacy where you get to walk away when the judge makes the decision and you're, you've got clean hands. As a judge, it feels really different. And I will give you just one example. And, and part of it is it leads you to try to be very careful in the way David has said sort of small C conservative, be careful, try not to make mistakes, obviously. But there is a sense, and that kind of responsibility is all a good thing. There's a sense in which you can feel complicit in decisions that do not, you know, you're bound by precedent, that's your job, but sometimes you are issuing decisions that do not conform to your sense of what is just. And I will give you just one example. Um, and I think a lot of judges feel this way, that mandatory minimum sentences, and, and I will cheerfully say this, to me, th th those are just radically inconsistent with justice in sentencing, which has to take account. Of it. <laughs> then I won't explain why, okay. You understand why, right? If you're sentencing a person, it has to be about the whole person. It cannot be about this one thing they did wrong. But mandatory minimums take that away from judges, and it is a very difficult thing because your relationship to the decision now is very different. That's my decision when I affirm that sentence. And it's hard. Yeah, one of our friends who's a federal district judge said to me last night that the hardest thing about the job by far was sentencing. Mm -hmm. That that's what really caused him more agony than, than anything else. Sri? Yeah, so I, I guess I've, um, very interesting to hear these comments because I've had a lot of the same thoughts running through my mind in various dimensions over the years about the different capacities in which we've all been fortunate to participate in this great system. Um, I guess part of my vantage point on it is a time horizon and an expansive interests dimension. So for example, I was having a conversation the other night with David Strauss, who I'm sure, I assume is here, um, but he made a really interesting point about academia. And it, I don't have the academic experience, nearly the academic experience that these three do. Um, uh, I've written a couple of things that no one should ever read. And, and then I, I That's teach. About the same experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I teach as an adjunct to civil, civil rights statutes in the Constitution at Georgetown, but, but as an adjunct, which I love doing, but not the, I haven't immersed myself in academia in the way that you have. But I, one 
idea about academia is it's a ground for you to propose an idea. Think about it a lot, vet it with all of the other folks in the discipline, and then put it out there for the world to comment on. But it's an idea that you've embraced, you've thought about, and it becomes part of you. And it's an enduring thing. So that's an idea that's going to hopefully stand the test of time, and you're going to sit there and back that idea to the hill. And 10 years later, you're still going to have the same idea, but you're going to have a different manifestation of that idea. But that's your principle, and that's part of your academic fiber. Uh, whereas in the other ways in which I've practiced law, at least, there's not that longitudinal consistency over time. So even if you're a litigator, for example, whether it's with the executive branch or in private practice, which we've all done, it's a short time horizon, especially in private practice. You're trying to win a case. You're trying to win a particular case, and that's it. With the executive branch, it's a little bit of a longer time horizon because you, you are trying to win a case, but it's with the institutional interests of the United States in mind, at least in the federal executive branch. And so you're taking into account that perspective. So for example, one vignette through which that manifested itself in my experience is in the immigration space. And I argued cases for the United States uh, enforcing the immigration laws. And I, I looked back at some cases that I'd handled, and it was striking to me that the case, one of the cases I argued for the United States involved somebody who was here and who had a citizen wife and children, but he had come here unlawfully, and there was an effort to figure out whether the laws that required him to go back could be fairly applied to him or whether it would be retroactive to do so. I don't know if, if David Gossett is here, we, we argued the case against each other. And that case for me as an executive branch attorney was all about the system and about the institutional interest of the executive branch in vindicating the principle of law and the statute that we were trying to get construed in the way that the Supreme Court ultimately did in our favor. And then you flip it around to what happened in private practice. When I was with Pam and Walter in private practice, we had a robust pro bono practice in the Supreme Court. And one of my clients in a case was also a person who was here with family and with children under threat of potential removal. And we were trying to get his misdemeanor conviction uh, construed as a misdemeanor because if it became a felony, then he was under danger of being deported from the country and being separated from his family and his children. The same factual dynamic, really, but from the exact opposite vantage point. And that one, too, fortunately, we happened to win 9-0. Uh, and so he got to stay here with his family um, and his children. But doing, in some ways, the same factual context from opposite vantage point and reflecting back on that told me that you, there's a, just an institutional type of interest, an expansive type of interest that you're vindicating when you're with the executive branch. And there's a pointed, focused interest that you're trying to vindicate when you're representing a client. And that was really brought home to me after the argument, and the, uh, after the argument with the case, we represented Salman Abu al and we're standing outside the Supreme Court. And I've told this story before, but it, I think it bears on everybody, especially the young people who are in the room. Uh, I asked him, he got to come to the argument, which never happens when you're a criminal defendant. Uh, he, was a, he had been convicted, because usually you're confined, but he wasn't. So I asked him, Salman, you know, I thought the argument, it was nice, the court really understood our position. We have to wait and we have to be patient to figure out what's going to happen. And, um, but I'm so glad you were able to hear to see this. And he said, we're going to win. And I said, um, Salman, I, I, I know what's on the line for you and your family, but, and I want to be realistic about this. I've argued cases before where I thought we were going to win and we didn't, and where I didn't think we were going to win and we did. So I, I just want to be objective with you about what can happen, and we have to be understanding that the court is going to take its time and issue a decision, and then we'll come to see what happens. And he said, we're going to win. <laughs> and then I gave it one more try, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try, because I know what's on the line for him and his family. And I said, Salman, I just want to let you know that things are unpredictable here. And he said, we're going to win. And then finally, I said, Salman, why? Why, do you, why are you so confident we're going to win? And he was an individual of Palestinian descent who had come to the United States at a young age. And he said, because this is America. And what happens in America is if you've been wronged, you take your case all the way to the Supreme Court if you need to, but justice will prevail in the end. And I just thought, wow, this is a guy who came here at a young age. He has this degree of confidence in the system of justice that we're all privileged to be part of in some capacity. And it just renews your faith in the system, no matter what role you're playing in it, whether you're the longitudinal, expansive perspective from the executive branch, or whether you're the focused, client-specific perspective from representing an individual. But this is what this person thought about the American legal system. And just to the punchline is he was the guy could predict Supreme Court decisions, it turns out. <laughs> uh, a few weeks later, we, have, we, we prevailed, uh, fortunately, for him and his family. But as I think back on 
the experience of representing sort of two sides of the same kind of factual complex, it really resonates really with me that there are, there's a different aperture through which you're approaching the same set of legal questions depending on your role in the system. You know, I, I loved my years in, in teaching. I really cherished them. I wouldn't give them up for anything. But once I'd had the experience in government at, at the Office of Legal Counsel uh, in particular, um, where you really are a final decision maker, unlike the SG where you spend your life trying to convince Anthony Kennedy of something. Um, but, it, but I found when I went back to teaching after that experience in government, I missed the immediate consequential effect of, of, of what you were doing. I remember staying up literally all night, Dawn with Jeff Powell, Chris Schrader, while we tried to decide whether we could approve the sending of US troops into Haiti to, to end the the uh, Tonton uh, Makoud regime uh, under, uh, under the war powers without more express congressional authorization. And it's, and it's a very agonizing decision, but at the end of the day, something happens. And, and that really was the genesis of the idea of this topic because the Washington Times did an editorial, uh, actually a series of editorials, does where Mr. Dellinger sit determine where he stands? And someone had faxed the remarks I made at the law school ALS convention about the need to get congressional authorization to invade uh, Iraq and, uh, and, and, and say, well, I changed my position. And I called the editorial writer and I said, this is a very good question. I happen to think there's a difference between what you need to send troops against the six or largest army in the world and deploying troops into Haiti. But assuming there's not, it's a really interesting question. Why should, should my position change? And I said, one of the things is, we don't start at OLC analyzing a question like that by looking at what I might have written. We look at Robert Jackson's opinion authorizing the, 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 the sending of troops into Greenland in 1940, on the, before war was declared in World War II. That's the system in which we're operating. And the position of the United States government shouldn't change if I'm hit on my bicycle and Dawn suddenly becomes, you know, takes over as head of the office, that, that there is an ongoing tradition, and that's part of what the difference is in roles. Well, Walter, may, there's really two different ways, I think, of thinking about how role can affect the way you approach a problem. One is certain roles just have their own defined rule systems that other roles don't have. I mean, you know, in all honesty, being in academia, following precedent is not really the aim, right? right? If it's already been the said opposite. before, you right. wouldn't want to say it again. Right. So that, that's one way in which, and I think as judges, I mean, I, I imagine most judges find that aspect of it, you're already acculturated, yeah, that's part of what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna to have to follow the rules of this system. I'm okay doing that. I know it's my obligation to do that. I understand why we have those rules, so when the precedent's clear, I follow the precedent. I think there's another aspect of it which I don't know that I fully expected until um, I was at OLC the second time around as the acting head of the office, but now very much as a judge, and, and I think it's a point that Pam is getting at when she says it's on you. And that's a different way in which role impacts you, and that's when you are the final decision maker. Um, you learn a tremendous amount about yourself, I think, having that responsibility. Because, uh, as Pam said, you can't walk away from the opinion you've written. You know, that, that turned out to be what you were comfortable putting your name on. Then you have all your reasons why some of them are about precedent and the like, but it is, in the end of the day, you did that, and it had that consequence. Um, but I actually think that's an experience that, if you think about it, is common to almost all professional work. You know, when, when you're the teaching assistant, it's different than being the professor in the classroom. You put on a class of a certain kind that had those students have that experience that day, because you chose to make them have that experience. You created that tone for that classroom. And I think um, being aware of that is very, very important <laughs> for people who are exercising final decision-making authority in whatever domain 
uh, it is. Um, but I think it's in a way the part of the job that I least really could have expected. Um, I think it's part of the job that's probably the most motivating. Um, but it's in a, a lot of ways, I think, the hardest part of the job. Yeah, you know, even within the executive branch, roles differ. Once I, uh, we were heading towards an opinion that a proposal of the administration was going to violate the Establishment Clause. And the Deputy White House Counsel called me to argue that we were wrong in not giving the President what he wanted. I won't, I won't say who it was, but her initials were Elena Kagan. <laughs> uh, and so she kept me up until like one in the morning, arguing and arguing and arguing. And at the end of the day, she said, okay, I knew that was gonna be your position, but I thought the President deserved for me to give it my best shot. And I thought, that's right, that's her job, this is my job, you know, uh, we have different roles in the White House Counsel's Office, you're an advocate for the President, and we did not conceive that to be the case when we were at OLC. She was giving the, pre the best argument she could for what the President wanted to do, and I was saying we couldn't do it. Right, let's go back to, to, uh, to judging. Um, one justice about to be asked me what I thought the hardest part of the job was, and my guess would be, and my guess was, it would not be deciding what you thought the best answer was. It would be deciding when you ought to defer to somebody else about that best answer, because every, everything that comes to you has been decided you know, first by Congress or the president or an executive agency or a town council uh, or, and or a federal judge or a state court. Uh, and so how do you balance your own best view against, uh, against the, the deference to others? Pam, you want to start? Well, um, I mean, I think there's sort of two ways of thinking about that. One is, you were talking about deference to decision makers who have looked at the issue before it got to our court. So whoever made the original decision or the district court judge that reviewed it. For me, a lot of that is answered by standards of review. And I will say, as an advocate and as a teacher, I did not pay enough attention to standards of review. They turn out to drive an enormous amount of what we do. A lot of them are really good and really intuitive. Um, like when, when we review sentences, I'll go back to sentencing. You know, we ask first, is it procedurally regular? Did the district court judge go through all of the right hoops? Did the district court judge sufficiently explain the sentence? All of that. If all of that was done, then we give a lot of deference at the end of the day to is this the right sentence when we review it for substantive reasonableness. And that makes some sense. Like if all the work was done correctly, that's the judge who had the defendant in front of him or her, that's the judge who had the best shot at really understanding who this person is, and so it makes sense that we would give a lot of deference to the result of that. So I think a lot of standards of review are pretty, they make a lot of sense, they work pretty well, and they really help to answer that set of questions. Um, the other really hard question I find is how much deference do I give my colleagues right. who are hearing the case at the same time as me? How much is about what I think in isolation and how much is about what I think in relationship to what these other two judges think? And on our court, at least, we have a very strong tradition of what I think of as a kind of a deeply substantive collegiality where we really care about the collective nature of the job and sort of making decisions um, in a very interactive way, hearing each other's views respectfully, um, really trying to account for them in decision making, and I'm a fan of that. I, there are different ways you can think about being an appellate judge. I actually really like that way. I think it, I happen to have the benefit of sitting on an enormously diverse court. Fourth Circuit has become so diverse, both in terms of personal background, <coughs> professional background, kind of world view and values, and the kind of collegiality I'm talking about is what allows me to take advantage of that, um, to really learn from my colleagues. So, so, so I think of it sort of as these two different questions. Um, that second one, how do I think about my colleagues, mm -hmm. has been something I've wrestled with more as a judge. Well, it's one of the dramatic differences from teaching, which is very much where you, you state your own very personal yeah 
view. And, and, and you know, we have multiple member panels uh, to, to try to draw upon that. What, what, what is your experience? Yeah, that to me, uh, David was talking about what uh, the biggest sort of surprise of becoming a judge. It just, I think it reveals my own myopia, but I think I had this vision of judging in mind when I came upon the job that you assimilate a bunch of inputs, you get brilliant advocates like all, all of you all who give great arguments, and you assimilate those, you take them into consideration, you go back to your own you know, isolated chamber, your vestibule, and you process it all and you put it through the algorithm and then you come out and you announce the result. And then, I, you know, I was kind of stealing myself to do that. Uh, I will tell you on the side that my kids thought it was high hilarity that I became a federal judge because they will always say to me, Dad, the one thing you can't do is make a decision about anything. You can't, <laughs> you can't tell us where we're going to dinner. You can't tell, so the fact that you're deciding these cases is, is darn you know, it's incredible. But so then you think about what happens with the job. So if you go back and you do your algorithm and you come out and you announce a result, it turns out that nobody cares because there might be two other people who think something differently and then your result is thoroughly inconsequential. And so the, the kind of group decision making, almost game theoretic uh, dimensions of it, the collective action dimensions of it, have been the most illuminating and interesting to me. And the way I kind of think about it is, do, do you think about a court this way? Uh, it seems to me there's two ways to think about it. One is you're a s collection of individuals who happens to be together on a court, or is a court a body of which you happen to be a member? And I think, I think about it in the latter way rather than the former way, that a court is a body, and it's gonna be con constantly populated by individuals, but it, it's an institution unto itself that's, Ill, that's announcing results. And if you look at Supreme Court opinions, for example, it used to be back in the 1920s and 1930s and before that, that the court would issue opinions, and even if somebody dissented, usually the dissent would be just a one-line statement, something like, I found that the case, uh, I would have said that the case is non-justiciable. That's it. And I did a quick look with my law clerks, and if you look in the 1920s, one volume, 263 of the U.S. reports, seven out of 668 pages were separate writings. Were what? Seven out of 668 pages, or 1%, were separate writings. Wow. And then if you fast forward to the, to the next 100 volumes, volume 363, which takes you up to 1960 or thereabouts, 40% of the pages are separate writings, and that remains the case now. And um, to me, the, to think about the job as a court, as opposed to a series of indiv individuals, ogres in favor of the kind of dynamic that Pam was talking about, and that's what you try to do. And in deference to your colleagues, you're not the only one who's looking at something. Some other people who are uh, really committed and really smart and engaged, some of whom are in the audience today, uh, you know, these are the types of people whose company you keep, and you try to achieve consensus as an integral part of the institutional role, and that's something definitely I think that courts rightly are oriented uh, towards doing. David, does it differ on a smaller court, a court with fewer judges? Uh, well, I, I, we only have six active judges. Um, for a time, we only had three. So the joke was, you can go on bunk, but... <laughs> um, and I do think there's, th there's a reality to the interpersonal relationships you know, you want to get along with these people, they want to get along with you, you hope, and when it's a small group, you know, that I think is heightened. So um, on my court, uh, like Pam's, there's a high norm of reciprocity. Um, you know, comments are welcomed, they're not treated as critiques, but the understanding is that you're gonna receive comments in the same spirit. If that breaks down, the whole thing is gonna uh, breakdown, but just um, two thoughts on it. One is, you know, we're on uh, courts of appeals, and that's a very different model, I think, than uh, the Supreme Court, which is probably the most familiar model, particularly young people in the audience have, about what it is to be on a court. Um, occasionally, we go on bonk, and when we do go on bonk, I think it's much more like what it must be to be uh, on a court that has a discretionary docket, and that has its cases already picked with some sense that there might be a split on the court. So the really remarkable thing about the courts of appeals is these cases come in and, and we're not already knowing that we're in disagreement. So we actually start from the, I think, implicit assumption that we're in agreement. And then, at least in my experience of it is, which I wouldn't necessarily have predicted, at the argument, the, the panel 
in my experience, is usually working together to continue the assumed agreement <laughs> that we started with. Now, it may be evident that that's not going to work out and someone will dissent, but the spirit that's going into it is that our job, if we could, would be to come up with a resolution of this case that would be unanimous. When we go on banc, of course, that's, that can't happen in the same way or isn't as likely to happen in the same way because the very reason you're going on banc is because you know that you disagreed on the issue. That's a court that has a discretionary docket in which not all of them have to agree before they take a case. So the enterprise is just very different in, in that regard. But I guess the only, so that in a way facilitates deference to colleagues, and I just don't want to mislead people. The enterprise we're engaged in, that kind of deference isn't really sacrificing your view of things. It's collectively working together to come up with the unanimous uh, ruling that we're comfortable with. Um, but I do know Justice Stevens, through my clerk, did make a point to me, uh, I think while I was clerking, which, which has always stuck with me, which is, you know, you're not appointed as a court, you are appointed as a judge. And your voice, in other words, you, you have an obligation as a judge, <laughs> what do you think the law is? And, and it's important not to lose uh, sight of that. I think that's a struggle for, for anybody on a multi-member court, which is you know you have that obligation to the parties and to the public, and you have an obligation to be a working member of a court, uh, and how to strike that balance uh, is not always uh, evident. Speaking of striking balances, you three have been extraordinarily successful. Uh, how do you work out the personal and professional balance? That's always a challenge to everybody in our profession. David, I'll start with you because I see your spouse on TV a lot. <laughs> nah. Well, how, I mean, she really would want to answer that as well. But um, we have three children. My wife uh, went to law school, uh, I guess a year after me, we went to Harvard Law School together. And then she uh, moved out of law and became a national security expert. She was the Homeland Security Advisor to the governor of Massachusetts. She ran for governor of Massachusetts. She is a national security expert on CNN, and she was an assistant uh, secretary of Homeland Security. She runs a ride-sharing company. I, I don't do as many things as she does. <laughs> and we have three children. Um, so I do think, like, how do we uh, balance it? I, really, you probably should ask our kids whether we balance it. But I think the, a couple things that have been key for us, um, we really have not had bosses. <laughs> I mean, from being honest, it's a big help. We have an enormous amount of flexibility in setting our schedules. And that's an enormous advantage when you have children if you want to pursue a professional life. Now, you know, you can choose a path that it makes it more likely that your life will be organized that way. Um, and uh, I guess we did. I don't know how much we thought about it. In those times where we really did have a boss, when she was an assistant secretary in the administration and I was um, acting head of OLC, I don't think we had a good work-family balance being candid. You know, I mean, it was worthwhile work, but after two years, I didn't see how I could continue to do it. I don't think she saw how she could continue to do it at that pace, given the, the children, how we wanted to be with our children. Um, but that's another way to think about it, which is your life has periods to it. And one way to think about balance is over time rather than at every waking moment, which right. I think is not a plausible uh, way to think about it. And then a second thing that's been really helpful to us is we've never had a commute. Um, a commute. And I think commute, if though. you can uh, uh, organize your life where you don't have a commute, it's a big, big advantage because that's a lot of time lost doing something that you don't really it's not helping your work, it's not helping your family. It's okay. just driving somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I think we've, we've been fortunate in, in able to organize uh, our time that way. Yeah, I think balance over time is such an important insight. I, my wife started law school when our kids were two and a half and eight months old, and uh, we juggled, we, I literally threw one of our children, when she was coming to class and I was leaving teaching, we actually threw one of the kids because over the crowd of people coming in and out that I caught, we're trained. <laughs> but, but I thought, and all of my colleagues had, had wives when I started teaching, and not first law students and then, then, then lawyer spouses. 
And I thought, is, of all the time I spent on the kids, I thought, when the kids are grown up, I'm really going to work hard. And I did. And I, I put that part of my life, you know, more at a later point in, in life. And that, that worked out. I wasn't spending much time professionally as I was later. Uh, anything to add before I get to my last question? I do want to add something really quickly. Um, and I actually have a whole long talk about this that I go around the country giving, and I've got lots of practical tips and everything, but we're short of time, so I'm going to really hone my message down to the basics here. Um, and you're just going to have to indulge me for a second. Fully respecting every, and I'm going to speak mostly to the women here, because not because it should be that way, but because my strong sense is it still is the fact that women wrestle with this issue in a way that men don't. Um, fully respecting, like every woman here, every person in this room, you have to figure out what is your joy, what do you find rewarding, absolutely. For the women in the room who think that their joy is going to be being a lawyer out in the world, that they have stuff to give to their family and their communities, but they also have something they want to give to the real world, the larger world, it's all a real world, the larger professional world, you should do that I agree that life comes in stages, but there's, you should do it all the time. You can't actually afford to step back for 20 years. You, you need to stay in the workforce. Um, you should do it if you want to do it. If that's what you think will be rewarding, you should do it. And please do not do it because you think, because you feel guilty um, about time away from your children or because you think you will feel guilty at the end of a long time um, that you will feel guilty for the way you have made your choices. And I'm speaking to you, I'm just one data point, but I raised two kids while I was um, a lawyer. I had help from people like Walter who helped me to make it work. It didn't work perfectly. My son is in the audience, he's 20 years old now. He <laughs> remembers times. We were just talking the other day, I'm sorry the time I forgot to pick you up at school and take you to your clarinet <laughs> lesson. Like whatever, it's on me. Other people in this room will remember there were times when my childcare would fall through. I brought both of my kids to a very early ACS board meeting. We're trying to have like a serious meeting. They're playing, like they've got coloring books under the table, someone spilled their juice. But it was fine. And the thing I want to leave you with is I am as proud of my parenting of my kids as I am of my work as a lawyer. I am deeply proud of the example that my husband and I set for our children, that my children grew up watching their mother incredibly invested in her career and in what she could do for other people in the world with her career. They grew up watching their father be invested in their mother's career. They grew up watching their father parent them as deeply as their mother did. And I really think they grew up knowing that they are at the center of my heart, but not at the center of the world. And that was valuable for them also. And so, I mean, thank you. So you all, you all will make the choices that feel right to you. All I'm trying to say is if what feels right to you is working as a lawyer and having a rewarding career as a lawyer and doing that full tilt, you should do that. One of the things I know is that all of us uh, in, 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 in marriages that, that where we had to share time, our kids are all fine. And I know your, ki your twins are doing great, right? Absolutely. Uh, so I, I want to ask one last question, uh, which is, is there, are there one or two books that you would recommend uh, uh, that influenced you or even entertained you? Uh, Shri, I'll start with you. Sure, so um, as I thought about this question, I knew it was coming, and I thought about it, and it turns out to be coincidental that the books that I can think of all have a criminal trial as a focal point, and I don't know, that just came, <laughs> it just happened. But what, one of the books, two of them came about as a result of travel, when I went to visit South Africa and Botswana, I read an old novel that many people would have read, but that I think is incredibly powerful in the way that it brings together a lot of themes that resonate with a lot of folks in the room about justice and injustice, um, about opportunity and lack of opportunity, about uh, globalization and localization, and it's uh, Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton, and it's just a, a brilliant book, and at the center of it is a father's struggle with his son's prosecution for murder. And there's, uh, there's Lincoln is in it, 
the second inaugural, the reference to the second inaugural. It's just a beautifully done book, and I, I would recommend that one if you haven't read it. I think people of our generation maybe have, and people of another generation maybe haven't. Uh, a second book, also travel related, when I went to India, I read a book called Behind the Beautiful Forevers by Catherine Boo, who's a Washington Post reporter. Similar, there's also a trial of a son in the center of that one too. It's true actually, but it's incredibly well done with a lot of the same themes and the same pearls of wisdom about economics and justice and uh, things of that nature. And then one novel I just happened to read, which I uh, like quite a bit, is called An American Marriage by Tyree Jones. And, and that one also has uh, not so much the trial, but the results of a trial of a person who was falsely, falsely convicted of rape and the effect, the toll that takes on a marriage in Atlanta. So those are three books that I would just suggest are things that David. I at like. Well, a book to read now, if you haven't read The Life of Frederick Douglass by David Blight, it's just an extraordinary book and, and the quality of, I mean, you could read Douglass in his own words, um, but the book is just a reminder of the quality of his language and then just the remarkable experience of what he lived through. Um, I mean, there's a scene in it on the day of the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation where he's on all of the uh, African-American population of Boston basically has gathered, and they're in a, a convention hall waiting for word of the Emancipation Proclam to be a, uh, uh, Proclamation to be announced. And they're waiting to hear from on the wire, has it come through yet? Because actually, up until the last moment, there was a lot of drama whether Lincoln was really going to issue it. And then this, I mean, this is, I mean, and this is Douglas at this moment, you know, after having been a slave and been freed and then, um, freeing himself and then um, thinking it would never happen and then waiting for that moment and then the word comes across it's been signed, it's been signed and he announces it um, and the book is just full of, of stories of that drama which are both you know the, the, the horror of, of some of our history and the promise of it is just encapsulated in that life in a way that's I think encapsulated in a few lives but um, when you were well, preparing for this uh, I was thinking about books. Um, I wasn't really thinking of a book to recommend, but I guess it's just a personal story of a book that had a huge influence on me. And I just tell it because um, I think if, if you reflect back on it, if there's a book that can have that kind of influence on you to, to appreciate the author for having written it. Um, but there was a book by Nathan Huggins, who was the uh, now passed away, but he was the chair of the African American Studies Department at Harvard, and he wrote a book called Harlem Renaissance. And when I was a young kid, and this just is to a point Pam makes about the ways that structures of life influence you and influence people that we don't always think about. So I went, I grew up in a suburban Northern Virginia um, place called Reston, which m many of you know. And somebody had the idea that the intermediate school for Reston would be named the Langston Hughes Intermediate School. I don't know who thought to do that, but a consequence of that small decision was uh, that we had a unit on Langston Hughes. And so my seventh grade teacher then made a reference to the Harlem Renaissance, which seemed like something I hadn't heard about and was interesting. It was all these uh, creative forces came to be in uh, black Harlem uh, right after World War I. And uh, then in high school, I encountered this book. I'm in a bookstore, and there's a book called Harlem Renaissance by Nathan Huggins, uh, which I read and was just a brilliant book and really set me on a path to studying history and sort of shaped my whole way of thinking about academia. I think it had a big thing to do with me end up being a professor. So very small things can affect uh, the way people's minds are uh, shaped. Uh, and I guess if you're fortunate to encounter a book like that, uh, be grateful somebody wrote it. Pam? I'll, be, I'll just I'll limit myself to one. Um, I'm going to go with 10th of December by George Saunders. And some of you may have read it. It's a collection of short stories. And it, I actually was thinking about it when Dawn was talking about empathy. Um, I, I view this collection of stories as sort of writing about the power of empathy and a testament to finding the connection the connectedness between people um, and between yourself and people outside your immediate circle, like that moment of recognition and the redemptive power of empathy. Um, and also the things that make it hard sometimes to find our way across divisions and, and, and see that personhood in other people. And I just, it was enormously influential on me. 
um, and I would commend it to all of you because empathy is really important and we could stand to have more of it. Okay, my favorite book is Go Dog Go. I mean, it was hard to surpass. <laughs> but I, the book that made, the writing that made the greatest impact on me, and I wrote an essay about this for the Washington Post when the James Baldwin documentary was up for an Academy Award that day, uh, is reading on a segregated construction site in the South at lunchtime, our 30 minute lunchtime, I was reading James Baldwin, Notes of a Native Son, and, uh, uh, and I think it just, the power of his writing uh, it should not be lost. It's just truly extraordinary. Uh, a gay black Harlem intellectual writing in the 1950s with extraordinary power. I think uh, Lincoln at Gettysburg by Gary Wills is, uh, uh, a book. Lincoln was a politician. He went to Gettysburg in part to influence the Ohio delegation. He knew he had to win re-election. Um, and, and, and those, I think, are, 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 uh, have an, a, a special effect on me. Um, so we've, we've, we've come to the end, and all of my time arguing before, well, first of all, this is just an extraordinary group of judges. Am I right? <laughs> In all my time arguing cases, there's something I've always wanted to be able to say to a panel of judges, and this is my one and only chance. May it please the court, your time has expired. Thank you. <laughs>